when you laugh at something together, it's, it's the closest point between two people because it's saying, I see you. That idea of like, oh wow, you get that, I get that. Like we both get that or you get me. It is about the connection that's working with healthcare workers and families dealing with Alzheimer's and all who are isolated. The fact that I know how to break down the elements that go into creating laughter. And if you would have asked me last year, oh, you're gonna do virtual storytelling and parties for companies, I would have thought, that. no. Dear Family is a podcast hosted by Rachel Steinman, a writer, an educator, and a mental health advocate. And Rachel gets us up close and personal, so we feel a strong connection, familiarity, and comfort with her guests. So settle in and join us as we search for true healing and journey with Rachel and her most interesting guests. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Dear Family, the podcast. In fact, this is episode 71. And if you are listening to this the day it launched, it is the day after the winter solstice. My previous episode talking about lessons to bring into 2021 really ended with two cliches. One is that it's always darkest before the dawn. Today and moving forward, we should be getting longer days of light and I'm hoping better and better news as we move into the spring. And the other cliche that hindsight is 2020 really helped us see what is most important in life. And one of those things for sure is laughter. And that's what my next wonderful guest, Danny Klein Modisette, is bringing us. We really all could use that laughter and that wonderful connection that laughter brings. I want to thank you so much for listening and subscribing and sharing this podcast with your dear friends and family. That word of mouth and that sharing really goes far. And also thanks for following me on all the social media platforms at Right Now Rachel. That's right with a W. Merry Christmas to those who celebrate. Happy New Year. I hope that this is a wonderful New Year for all of us. And may all our wishes come true. Happy holidays. Take care, everyone. And enjoy this awesome episode. Danny Klein Modisette is a comic who could not make her mom, who had Alzheimer's, laugh. So she hired a professional to do it. And it worked so well, and it changed her mom's life in such remarkable ways that she decided to launch Laughter on Call, a company that now helps people from all around the world. And her business also does corporate events like Zoom happier hours and kids' comedy classes. Danny tapped into the value of laughter as medicine because she understood how shared laughter deepens connections. Considering many people are afraid to be around or at the very least uncomfortable with Alzheimer's, she trains her comics and the memory care specialists dealing with seniors on how to find those connections that are often made all the more difficult because Alzheimer's blurs mental and physical health. Danny is a graduate of Dartmouth College, where she studied theater, and she went on to work on Broadway for many years before moving west. She taught the art of stand-up comedy at UCLA for over a decade, and she's produced numerous live comedy shows all over the U.S. Her writing has appeared in the New York Times, the L.A. Times, AARP, Parents Magazine, and dozens of websites. Her work addresses some of the biggest changes in a person's life, from marriage and parenting to caring for aging parents, and how humor can help. Her positive, upbeat personality encourages everyone who comes in contact with her. She lives in Atwater Village with her husband, her two teenage sons, and Pepe the dog. Hi, Danny. Welcome to Dear Family. Thank you so much for having me. So happy to have you. You and I connected through a mutual friend, John Lair, who is a comedian and an actor, and I had the great pleasure of interviewing. We realized how many friends we had in common, that we both have kids the same age with seniors that are applying to college. Your husband's name is Todd, correct? Yes, it is. So is mine. Yes, so there's another coincidence. (laughs) What we really share in common is that we understand the value of laughter. And we see laughter as medicine. Because this is a podcast about family, I like to start by having my guests tell us a little bit about their family. I have a husband and two sons. My sons are 17 and 13. 
And my husband, uh, we just celebrated 19 years, which is congratulations. And we live in LA on the northeast side of town. And uh, the kids go to public school. We're like LA peeps. Awesome. You and I are both living in LA, but you are not from LA. You grew up in Manhattan. Tell us how and why you ended up moving to your summer house in Westport, Connecticut. Ah, very good question. I was born in Manhattan. I believe I was born at the Leroy Sanitarium, which makes so much sense. And then when I was about nine, my father was in the garment business. We were a typical Jewish immigrant people. His business went bankrupt and we had the summer house in Connecticut. We lived on 57th street. We had my mother's dream life. And then the business went bankrupt and he literally came home with candy and flowers one day for her and said, we're moving into our summer house, which really was like a cottage. Ended up in Westport starting fifth grade and stayed there through high school. So I have kind of this split personality. I have the urban thing and then I definitely have the suburban thing too. And then I ended up in New Hampshire for college. And then I went back to Manhattan after that. And then I came to LA after that. You went to Dartmouth where you studied theater. And after graduating, you moved to New York and you were working on Broadway. Tell us a little bit about that. That was really great. I went to Dartmouth and while I was there for the summer repertory theater program, we had a visiting director, Jerry Zachs, who was a Dartmouth alum as well. I think he was a 67. And I worked as his assistant. I acted in one of his plays. And then in the other play, because it was repertory theater, I was doing the lighting, as I recall. He was going to New York to do a play called The Foreigner. I called and I asked him if he needed an assistant because I was coming to New York. And he said yes. And so I ended up staying with him for three years, taking notes, getting coffee, learning every single thing about theater. And he won five Tony Awards in the process. So it was a really wonderful experience and had no idea how much it would reverberate throughout my life, everything that I learned working for him. I can only imagine how much you saw and how exciting that was. And then you ended up moving to LA with $500 and you did some acting, you did some TV. And while you were waitressing, you decided to take a stand-up class at UCLA. And you went on to perform at in colleges and clubs, and you toured the country. And you were discussing things like eating disorders and giving people the room to laugh through difficult subjects. Tell us why taking that UCLA comedy class really changed your tra- trajectory. Great question. Yes, I was waitressing and I had a lot of comedian friends and customers would say, oh, you're so funny. Why are you waitressing? Everyone's asking, why, why are you waitress? And so I went and took this class at UCLA in stand-up and I had done singing when I was younger in nightclubs. So I was very familiar with like club life. And then I had this teacher, Shelly Bonus, who was actually Richard Pryor's, I believe, second or third wife who taught the class. This is the beauty of LA. And she took me aside and she was like, you're a comedian. You may never do this because it's a terrible life for women and for people and you may never do it, but that's your lens. And I didn't really understand what she meant, except that 10 years later, I went back and taught that class. And when you teach, you know that. When you teach stand-up, you know it. There's people that just come in and they that that thing. So yeah, it definitely changed the course of my life because it got me in the habit of writing. Once you start writing jokes and you understand joke structure, then you can blow that up and understand story structure, set up tension. And also the idea that as an actor, you can create your own work. You don't have to wait for somebody to give you a job. You can actually create works. I did quite a bit of that. I wrote the eating disorder references to a show called Too Thin, T-W-O Thin, about anorexia and bulimia, because what's funnier than that? And (laughs) we toured the country, did a very big college tour with that. After I wrote a show about marrying my husband called The Move, which all took place in my studio apartment in New York. And it was really about grief, but I didn't want to write a show called Grief because that's not fun. So it was about moving out of the apartment where I was living when my father died and how hard it was for me to get out of that apartment and give that apartment up because it was giving up my touchstone with that time in my life. 
Which does not sound very funny. (laughs) Oh, but it was funny. It was so funny. (laughs) But that's what I love. Like you you are able to take something that is really difficult and make it funny. And I think that writing with a sense of humor is harder than any other writing because you're taking really challenging subject matter and you're joking about it. Did comedic writing and stand-up comedy come naturally or how did you cultivate that? I think you learn comedy tools and structure and all that, but I'm looking at the world through a kind of skewed lens, just how I respond to the world. There are so many examples of that. Most recently, my mother died and we were all there and waiting for the moment. And I turned to the nurse who was in the room with us and I was like, well, you know, I, I think maybe, I think maybe this is done and maybe she's done. And then you just heard, Ugh. <laughs> and it was like so funny. It was just very dark and Joe Orton and just super funny. Did you guys uh, laugh? We did laugh. We have not done yet. Okay. But I really think that having a sense of humor and being an outsider and using humor to diffuse tension is, is in my blood. The move, that show, a lot of the flashbacks were at the dinner table when we moved to Connecticut and everyone was depressed and I actually made puppets and I used to talk to these puppets at the dinner table and I used the real puppets in the show and they were very funny, mean, little silly puppets. It was just how you process life and how you break tension. And it's also about truth. Comedians, we tell the truth. And that's what makes people laugh oftentimes is because, oh God, I would never say that, but we're willing to say it. That's interesting how you mentioned how as a child, you were using humor as a coping mechanism to cut through that tension. Going back to you teaching at UCLA, you taught there for 10 years. I taught in the extension program. I've taken extension classes there. They're always so good. LA, it's like we have our pick of- Oh, we're so lucky. Now people can take them online, which is really cool. What did working with students teach you? You have to be able to explain how something works. It taught me to be able to communicate how to create laughter, which then ultimately- now is such a big part of my life. It's working with healthcare workers and families dealing with Alzheimer's and all who are isolated. The fact that I know how to break down the elements that go into creating laughter. And I think that's the most interesting part is that what you learn ultimately is that laughter is the byproduct of all these other components being there, like listening and letting go the moment before and timing. It taught me how to break it down and make it available. You can't teach instinct, but you can teach people tools and give them opportunities to create laughter. You've written for the New York Times, the LA Times, for AARP, for Parents Magazine, dozens of websites. You edited a St. Martin's Press anthology called Afterbirth, stories you won't read in a parenting magazine, which was based on a show that you produced. And you also wrote a very personal book called Take My Spouse, Please, which is a great Uh, title. And it's about how to keep laughing in long-term marriage. Why does laughter allow people to open up? When you laugh at something together, it's it's the closest point between two people because it's saying, I see you. That idea of like, oh, wow, you get that. I get that. Like we both get that or you get me. It is about the connection. At that point in my marriage, I was so admiring couples who were If you had white hair and were holding hands and were laughing, I wanted to talk to you and figure that out. I really believe that such an important piece of going the distance was having a shared sense of humor, being able to laugh together because life throws you a lot. In the course of writing, Take My Spouse, Please, it was the elements of showing up and listening and letting go of the moment before and paying attention to Timing, as I said, and of course, having sex, which I would say jokes are to an audience like sex is to marriage. Without it, everybody gets restless. If you can continue to laugh with your spouse, your marriage is going to last. Not always. Obviously, it's generalizing. I read a quote yesterday that if you're just with someone for their beautiful flowers, then what happens during the fall? We have to be able to find that sense of humor and companionship as we get older and our hair turns gray. We lived through a pandemic. 
if, if ever there were a time where marriage is being tested, I mean, I think this is it. You just celebrated your 19th. Do you and your husband still laugh together? Oh, yes. Is he funny? He's very funny. Yeah, no, he's very, very funny. So sure. Yeah, that's an attractive quality for me, for <laughs> sure. People say I'm one of the best audiences because I, I love to laugh and I find so many things funny and my family makes fun of me because I laugh at my own jokes, but no one laughs at me. But I love funny people. I am just attracted to them. It really is a, a great quality. When you were on tour with your book, your mother was diagnosed with Alzheimer's and she was living in Manhattan. Tell us how that led to you creating Laughter on Call. She was living alone in Manhattan. My father died like 20 something years ago. I got a call from one of her best friends and she said, your mother is arguing with waiters and she can't remember how to fill out a deposit slip. And I remember thinking, well, arguing with waiters, that's not so unusual, but the deposit slip, that was a big tell. So my I have a sister who lives in Boston, so my sister and I both flew in, and we had some tests run at the Martha Stewart Center, which is a really wonderful resource on the Upper East Side, and she was diagnosed, and we quickly hired a team of people to take care of her, and then she quickly fired them all, and as is very common, she's a very independent New York City kind of woman, and then I decided that it was enough. I rehired people so she was cared for. But it was very expensive. It was like $17,000 a month to sustain. Wow. And she was barely leaving the apartment. So New York no longer held any promise for her. And the boys were young. And so I said, come to LA. And I found this place that is a, a memory care community. And there's specifically memory care. Silverado Beverly Place is the one that there's a lot of Silverados. And what I loved about this company in particular is that they are all memory care and they are completely passionate about it and their whole uh, stance is turning fear into love and that really spoke to me because one thing that I noticed in the difference between my father dying and my mother was that my father died of cancer and it was really painful and awful and morphine and the whole thing but people came to visit him until the day before he died and with my mother, I realized that within six months of her Alzheimer's diagnosis, she was down to two friends who would visit because it makes people so uncomfortable. And there is a lot of fear. And so that's what I loved about Silverado. So I moved her into Silverado. And within a week or two, she realized she wasn't leaving. And she became depressed and withdrawn. And I was feeling terribly guilty. And I was actually at my dentist. And because it's LA, she's like a life coach. And and I said, I feel so bad about my mother. I can't make her laugh. She's so sad. I just wish I could hire a comedian to cheer her up. And she was like, oh, you, why don't you do that? You should do that. And I thought, oh, can you do that? Can you hire her? Don't I need to go through an agency or something? And she was like, just go for it. So I got on Facebook and I put, i um, looking for comedian interested in gerontology paid gig. So I wanted some action. And my phone rang a couple minutes later and it was a friend of mine in New York, a comedian, and she said, I just got off the phone with my comedian friend in LA and she really wants to work with seniors. She's like sitting on park benches. You should call her. So I called her and she came over and she sat with my mother and she did all these things instinctively that we now know are so essential for connection. She just got down at eye level with her and she took her in and she was very honest and she said, I know you don't want to talk to me. You're probably thinking, who is this schmuck just talking to me and talking to me? And there was something about the word schmuck. And then my mother said the word schmuck and they were laughing. And it was just so wonderful to witness. It was exactly what I wanted. And I basically hired her on the spot and said, this is beautiful and terrific. And so she worked with her eight hours a week initially. It's great. Comedians want to have their own schedule. So I wanted her to have flexibility. And, and it really changed my mother's life. Within a very short period of time, she was eating again and joining in the community and laughing and even beyond the time when the comedian was with her. So I wrote an article about it for AARP magazine, and I got hundreds of responses back from the article, like, please, can you bring a comedian to Pittsburgh? I want a comedian in New Jersey. Can I have a comedian in New Hampshire? Like everybody want a comedian. And I thought, oh, I should do this. There's always comedians who need work. 
And this is an ever-growing numbers of people who can really use this laughter and who are not getting the attention that they could flourish if they had this kind of attention. So I created Laughter on Call. And that was the genesis of it. It started with all this one-on-one work. And we were very quickly all over the country pairing people up. But then people started asking for training. The residential community start they wanted training for their healthcare workers. They wanted family workshops. Then they wanted actual interactive storytelling, all based on the same premise of cognitive engagement. That's what we're all about. It's not a two-dimensional experience. It's not somebody playing, blowing in the wind while 16 people sleep. We very much believe in engagement. Now during COVID, we've transitioned to virtual and we're doing all of that same thinking and impetus to create connection is now something we're doing in the corporate space and with kids and all of it virtual. People don't remember what you said, but they remember how you made them feel. Your mom being in this community that's dealing with memory care, she's not going to have the memory necessarily, but she may hold on to that laughter and that happy feeling and that opens her up and that brings more connections. Alzheimer's is so difficult because it blurs both mental and physical health. Mm -hmm. And you had mentioned how when your dad had cancer, people came to visit. But when your mom was diagnosed with Alzheimer's, people just didn't know how to react. And she had very few visitors. Why are people so reluctant to be around people with Alzheimer's? And how do we change that perspective so that people show up for it? That's my raison d'être, right? So potentially, we different. But it is actually because I had both experiences. There's basically like two kinds of people. There's the people that say, I just want to remember her the way she was. There's those people. I won't say how I feel about that. I think we know. And then there's people who really do want to show up, but they're so afraid they're going to do it wrong or it's too exhausting or they're just so uncomfortable. They don't want to face it. It's their own fear. What if that happens to me? I can't even imagine it. It feels so humiliating to people that you would actually repeat yourself 17 times in 10 minutes and that they would, their own fear, they would never want to be a burden. They would never want to subject anybody to that. And they just can't be around it. What we really focus on is what are some things that you can introduce sensorially that will distract or engage? Music is really great. Any kind of pictures are great. Storytelling and asking questions. I always talk about comedic timing. So it When you hold for a laugh, you also hold when you're dealing with someone in cognitive decline. You can ask a question, but at a certain point, very quickly, it's like three seconds. If they don't answer, just answer because you don't want to humiliate them and remind them that they can't answer. So if I ask a question, hey, well, you know, so what did you like to do when you were a little girl? Pause, pause. Okay, well, you know what I love to do is, you know, and so that's why comedians are so great for this kind of work because we know how to just keep talking. I, I came up with an acronym. It's uh, Bilates, B-H-I-L-A-T-Y-S, and it's eight tools. And I say it's like Pilates for seniors. And it specifically addresses, okay, here's eight tools. And you can try these eight things. And if these eight things don't work, you can go home knowing at least you tried. But at least you tried. So, And it has to be with using music and being silly. One thing as people decline and they lose language in with Alzheimer's, they are still capable of mirroring. They're very sensitive to you and your presence. And so if you make a funny face, they can make a funny face back. And that is a connection in itself. And it makes them feel like you see them and they see you. The other interesting fact I learned from the Harvard School of Gerontology is that if the caregiver is depressed, there's a 10% greater decline in the person they're caring for with Alzheimer's. That's how sensitive people with Alzheimer's are. So I do a lot of work with self-care for caregivers so that they're able to show up and be present and access as much joy as possible in the given set of circumstances. 
I would think that that would translate to a caregiver in any scenario. Thank you for reminding us that if you are interacting with someone with Alzheimer's to engage on that multi-sensory level, you also had mentioned that you have to not have expectations going in. And I think that that's probably really hard for a lot of us, but it's a good reminder. I know that you're hiring comedians all over the country and you have a training for them. I'm assuming you have to vet them to make sure that they are comfortable with seniors. What type of comedy do they share with these seniors? Because obviously it has to be the reverse age appropriate. They can't talk about Nicki Minaj. They have to talk about things that seniors will understand. So tell us a little bit about that training. I come from stand-up, but it turns out wordplay and being witty and topical is not uh, a way to connect with someone in memory decline. So I've incorporated a lot of improvisation and improvisational comedians largely make up the staff now because it is about that back and forth and keeping it simple and working off exactly what they're giving you. And some of it is super physical gestures and voices and space work. All that is really helpful. We're not hip. It's not slick. We're not sarcastic. It really is a very different kind of comedy. And, you know, one thing that I make a big point of not only training comedians, but even with the communities or anyone that we're dealing with, is that we don't laugh at. We're laughing with. So we're about focusing on the foibles of humanity, of what you're afraid of, what you love to like an obsessive degree. We're not quite, we're not interested in your greatest jokes that you're going to send to The Tonight Show. Although Alzheimer's is nothing to joke about, some of the best comedy comes from sharp observations. Have you had a chance to witness any of your comedians discussing the relationships they have with seniors in their comedy routines, or is that not allowed? We try to be super respectful, but I have no control over what comedians... And I think, here's the thing, I was doing stand-up for a year in the clubs about Alzheimer's. Somewhere on YouTube, there's my uh, Alzheimer's set. It was very tricky because people don't like you to be making fun of people who are not well. You have to do it in a way that you're making fun of yourself. So if I'm making fun of my inability to manage the situation, that's funny. You can't make fun of the person. So I know that one of our comedians was doing some stand-up about the person that she's working with, obviously didn't use the name, and I think may have even turned her into her grandmother or her aunt. It's pretty rich, but it is sensitive, because I definitely tried. I remember doing a set in New York with my Alzheimer's material, and like, wow, crickets. They did not think it was funny. It's tricky material. Back when you started out and you were talking about eating disorders, sometimes those moments of discomfort allow that room to open up conversations. I think what you're doing is very important to bring it to the table. And to demystify it and to make it more accessible. My best Alzheimer's set, Wendy Liebman has a show in Studio City and it is a 40 and over crowd. That night I killed with all that stuff because they were all (laughs) going through it and they were so grateful that somebody was saying what it felt like to be in these circumstances. Saying what they're thinking. Yes, exactly. So know your audience. The the Alzheimer's set might not go over with the TikTok crowd. So you've had to pivot during COVID and make everything virtual, which we all have. Yet you're more needed now than ever because everyone's feeling isolated and potentially anxious or depressed. You were saying that the biggest challenge to corporate human resources or HR is their employees' feelings of disconnect Mm -hmm. and isolation. Working from home, they don't have that camaraderie. You're bringing laughter on call to company settings with your happier hour. Tell us about that. And how does that help create a more connected culture? It's very similar to how the Left on Call began is how this pivot happened. So March 13th, we were in all these communities. And then of course they said, you're locked out. We had a camera in the office because we had been training comedians around the country. And I said to my assistant, who's a lot younger, 
we should live stream. That's what the kids are doing. <laughs> I went and bought a light at Sammy's just as they were shutting the doors. And we live streamed on Monday. And we're still doing Monday through Friday from 12 to 12.30. It's an interactive comedy half hour. There's a fun icebreaker question. We get to know each other a little bit. People say where they are, where they're from, what they're doing. And then they answer a fun question like, if you were a dessert, what dessert would you be? And uh, then we do a little warm up and and we do some improv games. This has been running now 165 episodes and, and people so look forward to it and it changes your state of being. And I know this personally, you get on and I always feel like the hair club guy, like I'm not just a loner, I'm the member. Because if you get on at 12 and you're depressed or disconnected, by 12.30, you're feeling better. At the same time, the Atlantic, Forbes, Harvard Business Reviews were writing articles about how isolated and corporate erosion and how depression, you know, the Wall Street Journal is calling it the pandemic blues, that this is the biggest problem facing HR, as you said. And I thought we could do this. We could do this for anybody. We quickly started developing specific uh, workshops. The happier hour is because companies are holding these happy hours. But then people are getting on and there's no structure and they're talking over each other and it doesn't make anybody happy. So we're doing happier hours. It's structured and everybody gets a chance to really talk and say who they are, but it's in the context of prompts and games. Now we're developing all of our holiday party ideas because companies have budgets and they want to bring people together to celebrate. So we're being super creative about how we're going to run these and bring people together. If you would have asked me last year, oh, you're going to do virtual storytelling and parties for companies, I would have thought, no. I was stalling on Zoom for a long time. And now we're super excited. The feedback has been amazing. Everybody wants to feel like they are connected through something joyful. We all have our connections through the not joyful. But this idea that it's a dedicated half hour or 45 minutes where we're just going to have fun, nobody's going to talk about work, and we're going to get to know each other a little better. Companies are still hiring people through this. So you have someone new coming onto a team, they've never met anybody, and they're supposed to just like, woo! So we schedule it, we bring everybody together, they get to know everybody, and it's in a lighthearted way where people are also taught just inadvertently how to listen better by nature of what we're doing. And Laughter on Call is a good umbrella name. The reason why I didn't do comedy for seniors, for example, is because laughter is my passion. I always knew it could go in so many places. We could work with kids. We could work with cancer. There's so many places to take it. Even before COVID, I didn't want to feel like I was limited to just working with seniors, even though I love my seniors. You're even thinking about getting involved with dating services. Super funny to do through the virtual, right? Bring people together. They could have a virtual cocktail party, and it's a fun, uh, no-pressure way to meet people. So. Absolutely. Also, people are more attractive when they're laughing and smiling. <laughs> I have a question about the lunchtime thing that you do. Can anyone come on at noon? Yes. Lunchtime laughter is for everyone. It's free. And the link is on our website, laughteroncall.com. And Monday Great. through Friday, 12 to 12.30, we have people from all over the country. We've come up with other services that recreate that experience, we've given it a little bit of different name so it doesn't have to be at lunch, right? So there's the laughter gym and there's happier hour, there's holiday parties, there's laughter training, which is much more specific. It's more along the lines of the acronym that I talked about that teaches actual specific tools that are beyond COVID and help productivity and sales and all that. Lunchtime laughter specifically happens at lunchtime, although a lot of people we have from the East Coast, so they come for, I guess, high tea laughter. You're doing a public service. <laughs> you don't just work with seniors who have Alzheimer's or maybe we could call it memory issues. You also work with seniors who are former professors or are really bright and are interested in writing. You're teaching a memoir writing class, which I love. I, I just have to expect that's one of the highlights of your week. But it also makes me so sad to think about these seniors because with COVID, they're locked in their rooms and they can't interact. Tell us about 
about this class and what these 80-something-year-olds are writing about and also about the show that you're planning on doing with them. I love these people. It's a specific group of people that live at a community called Fountain View in Playa del Rey. And we've been working together three or four months. And they were given prompts initially, a significant moment in your life, the first time you drove a car, your first kiss. And then they grew from there. Now they just write on their own. And they were very interested in doing a performance. They're going to be ongoing. And it is a highlight of my week. They have amazing stories from the one guy was brought over from China, separated from his family, and then brought over on some government plan. And he tells an amazing story about going to the markets in China and seeing a real chicken with its head cut off, like what that really looked like. Uh, A woman who worked as a cocktail waitress back with the Rat Pack and... One woman who is an agent forever in Los Angeles and has great stories. They're like history books. I just feel so grateful. I always encourage them to more and more specifics. They're all isolated. This is their point of connection to each other. And they will say like, oh, you told me that story. That reminds me of this story. It's a very lively group and very appreciative and very smart. Because we're writing during COVID, I'm hoping to put together a book for them. I think this is going to be meaningful for certainly for their families, but even beyond their families, that this is first person accounts of this time in history. That is really meaningful. And I'm so happy for them to be able to have that connection with one another. You have two teenage sons. Do they think you're funny? It depends what time of (laughs) when you ask them. I think they think I'm funny. Yeah, I think laugh at them. That's good. That's good. Are they funny? Very. Yeah, both. Very funny. That's nice. In different ways. In different ways. My older son's very under. And my younger son is actually a performer. So he's really... Got that gene. Got that gene. Nice. Last two questions I ask my guests. Danny, at 20 years old, you were at Dartmouth studying theater. If you could write your younger 20-year-old self a Dear Danny love letter, knowing everything you've learned up until now, what would you tell yourself? Dear Danny, first of all, take more writing classes. And then I guess I would say it's going to be okay because I think I never thought it was okay, anything. And you're going to be surprised that some of the more humiliating or disappointing aspects of your life that you focus on now will actually serve you well later. Try to find a little more joy. I was not the most joyful 20-something. Because both my parents are gone now, I would say enjoy the time with your parents because it doesn't last forever. That makes me emotional thinking about that because I don't think I appreciated that. It's beautiful. In a way, this is a legacy for your mom, what you're doing. Yeah, yeah, it is. She was definitely the inspiration and she very much liked being the center of attention. So I'm very, <laughs> very happy with that. Danny, what do you do that brings you happiness? Do you have any happiness habits? I'm super into dance. And Love that. I have found many dance classes. I'm a big fan of old school skinny that's right here in Culver City, run by a guy named Lucky. He and his wife, they have inspired me. And I actually went and took a COVID class with them. They do all Motown. So yeah, I'm really into dance. What's a COVID class? Like six feet apart with masks? (laughs) Exactly. And being with my family, even though we've been quarantined here, I still really enjoy dinner together and being together. It's a little corny and old fashioned, but I really do. I think because I lost my mother February, I didn't lose her. See, that's a comedian me. I didn't lose her. I'm very conscious of the passing of time. I know that my son is going to go to college soon, God willing, but all goes very quickly. I'm just very conscious of time. I really, really appreciate the time that I have with people that I love. I so relating to that right now. That is one of the silver linings. I feel bad for our kids. I feel like they should be able to go trick or treating or do all the things that we want them to do as teenagers. And yet, I am so grateful to have those meals and that extra time with them. Thank you for reminding us, for those that 
that are lucky to still have our parents to not take them for granted. You'll have to have your sons listen to this so they're a little nicer to you. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm sure they're very sweet. Well, Danny, this is amazing. Do you want to tell us where the listeners can find you? Thank you so much. Thank you. I appreciate how earnest you are about comedy. No, about bringing these ideas. Yeah, so laughteroncall.com. And you can reach me directly at Danny at laughteroncall.com. And I'll take any and all inquiries, questions, anybody needs support. I have become somewhat of the local accessible expert on the Alzheimer's journey. I'm always happy to give whatever help I can. And even if you need laughter for your office, we can do that too now. We're going to do a kid's camp during the December break that was very popular over the summer. It is on Zoom, which is why we're not doing it when school's running, but it's very physical and engaging. So it's not just sitting at your computer and the kids have a great time. We do breakout rooms so that the little ones aren't hearing about, you know, boys. Right. But we do all different comedy styles. We do stand-up, improv, clowning, and sketch. It's a whole comedy 101. And the kids so pick what they like. They get exposure and then they can see that you know, you can create. I think it's really important in COVID, in quarantine, to create. I think that's the way you circumvent depression. If you can feel like you're creating something and not just watching video games, that's what I've observed, is that the creating something is, has brought happiness. You are constantly creating different things. So you are a perfect example of that. Thank you so much for speaking with me today. Thank you for supporting comedy. and Of course. And and Thank you for all you're doing for our seniors who need to be held up and, and cherished. I'll let my memoir team know you said that. Please do. All right. Well, you take care. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Bye. This is Rachel Steinman. For more information or to contact me with any questions, comments, or guest ideas, please check out rightnowrachel.com. That's right with a W. Thank you so much for listening, subscribing, and sharing, dear family. And if you found value in what you've just heard, I would love and so appreciate a great review on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. Until next time, I wish you love, happiness, and good mental health.